Okay, today before we start the lecture notes, we're gonna do, we're gonna just have a quick look at um, the last assignment we had, we just released. Uh, this one. So these are the files I sent you. Uh, this is the uh, notes. We talked about the. We talked about a little bit about the optimization, what they do. Just have a quick review about optimizations in a more visual way. So let's say I have a function fx and the independent variable is x. By changing x, I get different values for the fx. And let's say fx is something like this one. I want to minimize this. Let's say minimizing fx in the real world, it's like I have some expenses in my business. I want to minimize this. I want to change some of the decision variables and decrease the cost, whatever I'm spending at the end is gonna uh, increase my profit. In this case, I have only one decision variable x, not x1, x2, x3, just one x. And the optimization is gonna find a bunch of initial guests, like for example, this one, is gonna pick up this point, this point, this point, let's say, let's say just three initial guests. And for each one of these x values the value of the let's say this is x um, I call you one this is the second guess x2 and this is the third guess x3 and for each one of them the value of f is going to be calculated and the purpose is to minimize this so the computer says, okay, um, this is the first one I'm going to calculate and I get the value of F1 here. And then for the second one, it's going to say, okay, this is the second one, this is F2. Then the computer is going to think, okay, the more I am moving toward the right side, the more I'm increasing the value of the X, the value of the F is going down. So I'm technically getting closer to the result. That's where the optimize optimizer is going to have another guess here, X3, which is going to calculate this one, and it's going to find F3. And essentially, the computer is going to say, OK, uh, this is not actually uh, less than uh, the F2. I was expecting the more I'm going toward the right, I'm getting a better result. So this is not happening. What I have to have, probably I'm going to have a minimum somewhere between this F1, or I can say X1, and this X2. So at the end, this is how graphical it's gonna work. Then it's gonna be another guess here, and then is going to have another guess here, getting closer and closer, then another guess here, and here, if there is another guess this side, this side is going to also getting closer and closer to somewhere here. And this is a minimum, but it's not the most minimum. This is called something local minimum, and what we are looking the genetic algorithm you're also programming is a global optimization and what we are looking is here so many of these the difference is about the way the algorithm works and also the initial guess in genetic algorithm um, in local optimizations not genetic algorithm it depends where you start if the initial guess is here the computer is going to move toward this kind of this direction. If you start from here, it's going to move toward this one. 
if you if you if you're using a local optimization and if you start from somewhere around here the optimization is going to move toward this one this side and if you start somewhere around here it's going to move also toward this one so depending on where your initial guess is located then you're going to have different answers if if i start from again here these these areas this is the result i'm going to get if I start somewhere around here, this is the result I'm going to get. This is also minimum, but this is called global minimum. This is called local minimum. And the difference between global and local optimization is global optimization uh, uh, doesn't have anything to do with where you start. It's better to start from somewhere better, but it still is able to get you this answer. And this is the optimization we're going to program. This is also a global optimization. Something is going to give you the absolute answer. Uh, but it might be something, the difference, there are lots of differences between local and global optimization. The algorithm, first of all, is completely different. Another thing is usually global optimization, they take more time than local optimizations. Going back to the notes we have, where we use them, you don't need to read this part. You can just skip through. I'm just, I wanted to give you an example of where we use these optimizations. Uh, this is something you need to study. Uh, you need to study about these ones. These are a bunch of definitions you need to know uh, before you start studying anything else, before you start even programming. This is also another example of local minimum and global minimum. Uh, the program, well, this is this function. And uh, this one is easy by looking at this one, I can get the answer. Or if, even if I do not um, visualize this figure, what I can do, this has uh, an analytical solution. An analytical solution in this case, I want to find these points that the slope is zero. I don't have any slope. To find the slope, I have to find the derivative of this function. And the derivative of this function, so there's two ways to find. One is analytical, and the other one is numerical. Numerical is like the optimization, a genetic algorithm, for example. This is numerical. Analytical is um, I just find the derivative of this function, which in this case is going to be 2x over 3 minus 1.5x2 and then minus eight x and then this is plus one so technically this is this is fx this is the derivative of fx and then if i say this is equal to zero i'm gonna find this this point this point and this point and to find the zeros of this function, I, you can just go on the internet. You don't need to do this, but um, if you want, the zeros of a polynomial function. We can write the formulation if you want, but you don't need to. Change my keyboard and I can't find some of the keys. Two x three and minus one. So 
So this is the degree three, and this means I have three zeros. I hope this one is this website. Oh, that's just great. It's saying the roots of this one. Oh, really? Wow. This is great. Okay, these are the two points, um, or you can just, this one is better. Uh, I'm not sure if it's clear enough. Okay, the way these x values, x0.2 of something, or x minus 1.7 something, and the other one is 2.35 something. This is, this is calculated the way it's calculated is in analytical solution, but many functions in the real world, we don't have an absolute analytical solution. That's where it comes to numerical solutions, and that's where we use optimization algorithms, something that you're gonna use here. Let's say you have a cost function, you have lots of things, they don't have analytical solution, and sometimes uh, when you're solving, when you want to op optimize a function, those functions are differential equations functions and they don't have even an analytical solution. Again, you have to go after numerical solutions to solve those problems. Anyway, this is an analytical solution, but what we're going to do is a numerical way. Keep guessing until finding the uh, final answer. Going back here. And at the end, well, first of all, you're going to read about this genetic algorithm, and then these are the functions we're going to minimize. So technically, this these, this function I mentioned are these ones. The definition of these functions, you can find them here. Let's say levy function, I guess something new. Let's say Levy function here. This one has x2 and x1. Our example had only one x. But here has x1 and x2. This is the formulation. But you can, the reason I gave you this function because it's not limited only to x1 and x2. You can write the function the way it can re receive even more x values. Only a 3D value, a 3D plot can be plotted here. That's why they're showing only x1 and x2. But this function, you can decide about the dimension. Dimension can be, if it's one, then in that case, we have only one x. If the dimension is two, we have two x values. And this is anyway, this is the formulation. And it says we optimize this one between uh, minus 10 to 10 this example we had is like okay this is the span of the x x is from 10 positive to minus 10 I don't want to try any x value let's say it's equal to 11 to something it's not in my span I want to only pick the x values which are between these two and then this is the span this is the number of the D values. When you're programming, you're gonna program it the, the way that D is given by the user. So in the, also in the real world, uh, it's not an optimization problem you're gonna have. It's not necessarily going to have always two decision variables. Sometimes we have hundreds of decision variables. And then here, we can put, here this website is telling you um, is giving you the absolute answer. It says, okay, when you're solving, just keep it in your mind that the most optimized value between this span for levy function, 
is when it happens when the x value is equal to 1. If you have 1x, then x1 is equal to 1. If you have 100, 1,000, 1 million x, all, when you put all the values equal to 1, then this function is going to be equal to 0. And that's the most optimized, the most minimized value you're going to get for the fx value. In a graphical way, I can see uh, the scale of this plot. I can see, okay, this is the f. I can see, okay, this is the f. And the scale starts from 0. And I can make a guess, okay, the most minimum value probably I had here in this plot was zero, probably, depends how I plotted this figure. But when the dimension goes higher, not just x1 and x2, I have 100x, I cannot plot it. I have to go and use these numerical ways to find the answer. Right now, you know the answer, but in the real world, you don't know what's the answer. The reason why they give you the answer here because we use these functions to benchmark, to test our optimization algorithms. In the real world, you don't have the answer. You have to find something. Uh, going back here, this is the example of another function. This is the implementation of that function. And it's like if I pass x1 to xd, Maybe I can just open this function too. This is the other function. So this is the implementation of this function in C. And if I, this is the inputs, the number of the decision variables or the number of the dimension, I can say. It's better to say the dimension. Uh, and then the array of the inputs, which is x1, x2, x3, x4, depends how many x you have. And then this one is going to calculate the value of the fx for a given array of x values. If you pass x1 equal to 5.2, x2 equal to 3.4, and x3, x4, and x5, then this function is going to return you this value. And technically you have to have, let's say, I don't know, a million guess in computer is going to go so much fast. You're going to end up having one million different guess. And at the end, the computer is going to get closer and closer to a more minimized fx value, which here again, the computer this website is telling you check your answer with this one the absolute the answer is the most minimum value for the x or we call this objective function in optimization we call this objective function objective function is something we want to minimize it which by changing the values of decision variables which is like x1 x2 x3 so x the values of the x are called decision variable the other one, which we want to minimize, is called objective function. Anyway, this website is giving you the answer. It says, okay, check your answer with this one. If you did find x all equal to zero or close to zero, this is a numerical way. Numerical way, we always have errors. It's not going to be like analytical solutions, absolutely correct and accurate answer. Here, we're going to get values which are close to zero. Close. We're going to have some errors anyway. And if your values are close to zero and fx is gonna is gonna be equal to zero cl or close to zero then your optimization is working is able to at least optimize this function um whatever you files you need is all on github avenue just after reading this one you must do this numerical example if you don't do this, do not go to the next step at all. Don't bother yourself because it's going to be so confusing. Write this down on a paper because this is exactly what we are going to do, what we're going to program. If you don't understand the logic of what you're programming, it's almost impossible to write the program because it's not about the mathematics behind the logic. Now it's also about finding 
the code like the errors you might have in your code do this on a piece of paper write this down step by step understand what is fitness what is understand all the definitions here and also what is the probability and at the end also you are going to calculate the probability if you're going to calculate the probability you're going to, going to write the program for the probability but you don't understand how it's calculated then you it's going to be difficult also you have some divisions here when it comes to the programming you need to understand okay what if this one is zero then it's division by zero is going to happen and C is a lower programming language and I have to be able to predict some problems in the future because C is not going to be able to handle this division by zero I have to handle it, I have to think about what I have to do here anyway, uh, after reading this one then check this code this code uh, you don't need to have this code on uh, let me see I can open it if you don't have VS code to read the Python codes uh, you can just use Google Co-op Okay, the same thing after reading that paper, we're doing exactly the same thing here. Creating a population after you read the definitions, you can understand this code. Before reading this, before reading all those stuff so far we talked about, this population, you're gonna ask what is population? And it's gonna be difficult for you to deal with this. So make sure first you read the previous stuff, then you come to this code, and then you calculate the fitness probability, here you can see I just simplify, simpl uh, simplify this um, division by zero saying okay you know what uh, fitness might go to zero but what if I add a very small value you can think of your own solution how to deal with this one and then I find the probabilities and this is not very accurate the best way to deal with this but here is fine um, then the other stuff here anyway then at the end you're going to create a new population what is a new population again you have to go find the definition of the genetic algorithm to just give you a general idea they found this optimization algorithm based on really genetic science they said okay we have two different speci species and then those ones which they have characteristics features let's say we're talking about two different plant species those ones during the evolution process we're talking about millions of years billions not billions of years millions of years of uh, evolution uh, those species who survived they had some characteristics in their chromosome their, in the DNA that they could uh, kind of survive on this planet earth and this is also what's happening here we create a new population using those species which have a better chance to survive and then a bunch of other calculations and printing some things uh, this is only one iteration at the end in the real world uh, in the in the genetic algorithm you're gonna write in C you have to do many iterations this is just one time iteration going back here this was just introduction so so far whatever you have studied doesn't have any points then just the implementation starts uh, you're gonna have two uh, four codes four C codes uh, three of them are source codes the other one is the library just uh, mentioning the functions you don't need to change anything in this one let me see if some of the students mentioned that I have okay do you see this one uh, this is wrong the only thing you need to change here I'm gonna also post something on teams you need to mention this one. whatever you're generating a random number if it's double you're gonna use this function whatever you're generating an integer number 
this is the function you're gonna use anyway this one's something which I missed to mention inside here but I'm gonna post something you don't need to uh, don't worry about this one anyway these nothing do not change anything except that one in this file do not change anything except that one because you're not gonna submit uh, this file I'm going to use my own version version of this functions that H of dot C here is the objecting function you're gonna minimize like I said you have different functions and I mentioned also these the name of these functions here you don't need to write the program for this one it's already inside of dot C let's say this one let me open them this good to show you how okay uh, let's say this is levy function um, when I'm minimizing the levy function I just need to comment to the rest and keep only this one levy function if I want to use another function I comment this one let's say I want to use this one Gui rank and I just uncomment this part so you don't need to write the program for this function they're already available here Feel free if you want to make any change here, but again, I'm going to use my own version of of.c, which is this one, this, this original file. Going back to other one, functions.c, This was the functions that C, functions that H again. I'm going to change this one since you opted on Teams. But whatever we have declared here, the real implementation is here. Let's say generate random. And this is something we talked about during the lectures. Uh, we're splitting the files, the functions based on their purpose. Anyway, this one is generate random and whenever I want to generate a random double number I'm gonna use this function which is declared here but the real definition or the real implementation of the function is here you're gonna write your code here wherever you see your code you have to write something here welcome to add other things if you want but anyway this is the general format it's better to follow this one not to be confused about the rest by the way, we have different functions. Uh, after you study about the genetic algorithm itself, you know what is this uh, crossover, you know what is this mutation. Mutation, again, during the evolution, some of these species, they, they mutated, they muted to, and they changed into something new. That's also inspired, this function is also, in the computer world, inspired by the real thing which has happened during the process of evolution. The next one is GA.C. This is your uh, main function, int main. Guys, sometimes I see, uh, I know it's fine that you ask, you ask these questions. I absolutely welcome you. I welcome any questions because it's kind of a feedback to me to tell me how much you're understanding. And it's not about the issue of how much you are understanding or you're not understanding is about how much I am doing my job well to introduce you to the C but sometimes there are some basic questions let's say uh, what is the forward declaration backward declaration or I saw someone declared uh, was implementing I had someone to uh, present their code and I had someone who was starting implementing a function like void let's say rand or I can say my rand was implementing a function here and like this is like absolutely whatever we discuss is just it's like a waste of time by the way this is this is not the place to do your function this is like your in function and you don't need to you're not gonna write any function inside here 
the purpose of also explaining this assignment, just um, give you a heads up, uh, marking scheme also is going to consider splitting the code based on the purpose. Here inside this main, you only need to call your functions. You're not going to implement a function here. Anywhere you see the, your code, you're going to follow the instruction, you're going to write your code. You can change it slightly, of course. Um, this part, you need to change it based on what function you're using. Let's say if I am using, uh, I'm using, let's say, levy function. Okay, I need to change This is the lower bond and upper bond. We discussed about this one, but you can go to this website again and find the levy function. If you're going to minimize the levy function, you're gonna go here, and this is the lower bond, and this is the upper bond, and this is the D in dimension of the thing you're gonna optimize. If the dimension, let's say, is 10, I have 10 decision variables, that I can change, I can play with to minimize the levy function. Also, I need to have 10 uh, lower bond values. I have to keep doing this one for 10 times. But anyway, right now for the levy function is minus 10. So technically I have to change this one to minus 10. But depending on what function you, you're going to optimize, you're gonna optimize or you can say minimize you need to change slightly this one and here is also example for the levy function and also the other one as well the green the green one function which is this one the minimum is here the lower bond for every x every decision variable is this one the upper one is 600 that's why we are having this one and if it's seven i need to have seven for every x i need to have one lower bond and one upper bond. X2, this is lower bond, this is upper bond. X3 and the rest. You're gonna follow these instructions and if you know again what is the max, what is the genetic algorithm, you know what is this max generation. Max generation means again during the process how many generation were did exist and evolve. Let's say in humankind we're gonna say every generation like they on average they live six 60 years and then you're going to divide how many times you're going to evolve these generations to get the to get the answer what you're looking for by the way this max generation in a more computer mathematical way is just an iteration how many times you want to create a new population and then also you're going to measure the cpu time and i have the code i guess just show you what's happening here okay so let's say right now in the program I have I want to minimize the levy function and then I have a ga.c, which I don't want to show you a lot, but I'm just going to. Okay, this is, let's see, just I'm going to show you this much. Uh, I have 10 decision variables for the levy function. That's why I have 10 lower bonds for 10 different x, 10 upper bonds for 10 different x. This is this 10. The d, the dimension or I can say the number of variables, or in a more uh, mathematical definition, we can say the number of decision variables I have is also 10. Then inside the OF, this is the function I'm going to minimize. So technically I get rid of the other ones. And I just want to compile the code, GCC, GA. Well, you're going to submit with a um, make file, but right now I'm just making this work a little bit faster. Uh, 
don't don't do if you're watching this video don't copy this part I usually use something called sodium um, maybe uh, if you have time we're gonna talk about this one I use this library to create random integer numbers but you don't need to do this one you're welcome to do this but don't you don't need to do this one this sodium is not fast as much as the random function we usually use but there are some optimization problems like I said here it really matters where is the initial guess and the initial guess does really matter to have a better initial guess you need to have a function which is truly going to give you a very randomized function and the RAND function we usually at least so far we use in this course if you call this RAND function many times I'm talking about a million times then it's not gonna be really randomized and I had this problem in one of the neural networks I was developing here and I was not getting the answer that I was getting on MATLAB or Python everywhere else it was working the functions were working and I wrote the code also from scratch in MATLAB the same code from scratch in Python I didn't use any library but here in C it was not working and then I just changed this random function and apparently the problem was with the initial guess the initial guess had a problem and I needed because I was calling the rand function many times it was not randomized truly randomized in C anymore that's why I started using this one by the way you don't need to use this one that's why I am adding this flag to compile my code okay after having this GA created then the way I can run my code this is the population size let's say population 1000 maximum generation is 1000 uh, to just see, give you a more evolutional perspective about this population size population size it, it's like you have 1,000 plant in one bucket and then you want to keep mix these genetics between these genes or chromosomes between these plants and this is called population you have 1,000 different plants in the same bucket and then max generation max generation is you mix everything you wait until like let's say they die like how, how long they're gonna survive one of them is gonna survive two weeks the other one is gonna survive let's say two years you're gonna wait and see which one is gonna survive longer this is called max generation and every time that all of them they die you're gonna say okay let's just start from again beginning again crossover how much you want to mix these generations together again when you read the genetic algorithms definitions you're going to find this definition more clearly more in a mathematical way mutation rate is the plants they're going to have anywhere in the past uh, something has happened in one of the genes or something that one of the species mutated not necessarily something which was inherited from the previous generation it's something that completely new and the past generations didn't have those features neither that's called mutation rate by the way let's just do with uh, a crossover of five point this one two and also I guess I need something of the stopping criteria this is what you're gonna see in your computer well at the beginning these are my inputs that's why my inputs are printed out but I can see the computer is still working it's gonna take some time to minimize this function let's see what the computer is going to do okay uh, right now after 70 seconds when you're running when you're doing testing and you're getting the CPU time I suggest you to close other apps you have right now I have a bunch of apps that they're taking my CPU power close other apps and then do the testing anyway right now and my computer is taking 17 seconds to find these values the best fitness I could find in 17 seconds was 0.40 and something and if I check what the answer we have here 
it says, okay, the best answer is zero. You could not find the most minimum value, but it's pretty close. Like I have four zeros here. If you find with four zeros in your program, that's acceptable. That accuracy is acceptable. And then I have this best solution, X1, X2, X3, X4, and until X10. If I go back here, it says exactly at X all equal to one is the answer, is the zero is gonna happen. Well, I could not, I was playing around with these X values, but the computer was not able to find in at least in this limited generation max generation iteration if i increase the general max generation i'm going to find a better answer anyway this is what i have to see in my computer when i run your program and then you're gonna do some case study uh, number of value 10 function levy mutation rate and crossover with these features you're gonna fill up this table then mutation is changed everything else is the same you're going to fill out this table you're going to see the difference how it works then i increase the number of variables to 50. right now i had only 10. now i'm going to have 50. mutation is uh, the same as this one and still we're working with the levy function so i have 50 decision variables the problem is going to be 50 dimensional a lot more complex then i have lower bond upper bond um you can change the lower bond and upper bond and you can change also this one as well but to fill up this table you need to use not just levy function you need to change the, go here and let's say i'm gonna go with this one i'm gonna run the test using this rewind function and i'm gonna fill up this row I need to find the best solution it's up to you how much you're gonna pick the mutation rate and crossover and max generation population size and CPU time you're gonna report the CPU time but tell me what's the best solution you can find the most optimized solution we know what's the answer we know what's the answer it's zero we know this case in the real world we don't know that but uh here we just want to benchmark test the potentials that our algorithm has that's why we're comparing with something that we know already the answer anyway you're going to report also the best solution you have to play with these ones until you get a best solution which has at least four five digits after the decimal point accuracy report the same thing don't forget to create this appendix and then read me uh you're gonna create a readme file um in latex create the pdf file give me the also make file only only one student which is going to develop the fastest program faster 20 percent than other students is going to get this bonus only one student uh, in the past we had some students that uh they develop let's say right now it's six seconds and five digits of zeros we had some students they had zeros until here so the answer was pretty accurate because then after that one the precision is double and in double we're gonna have only 15 digits accuracy after decimal point so technically it was on the limit that the computer was able to measure which is the accuracy is significantly high and let's say the time measure here was around let's say one second or two seconds so definitely i'm sure some students they can improve the, this algorithm uh, to work a lot better future direction you don't need to do this in this assignment oh my god we will only we talk about this assignment in about one hour you don't need to do this one in this course um, if you're interested to work keep working in th this area this field you can do this one and the reason I gave you this future direction is you produce a software and if you don't present it 100% well you're not going to be able to sell it and selling in your mind maybe you're selling to a uh, customer you're selling to uh, you're putting that in your resume you're selling to those people who are going to hire you anyway pro uh, present your project perfectly 
and this is how you can do it. Um, first of all, make sure, try for this one, try to improve your genetic algorithm. Even if you don't improve it, it's already very, very, very valuable code you're gonna develop in C. It's in C, it's from scratch, it's very optimized. The genetic algorithm is something that works in many optimizations, many optimization problems. Anyway, it's already good, but if you do this one, if you use pointers, dynamic memory allocations, you need to a little bit improve your code because until this section, we didn't have much, um, I didn't talk about uh, at least the functions I gave you. I don't expect you to do the dynamic allocation anyway, just to simplify. You don't need to do dynamic memory allocation here, but when you want to do this part, do also dynamic memory allocations, use pointers, whatever is necessary. And then the same thing we had in the first assignment, creating a shared library to Python. Do the same thing for your genetic algorithm here as well and compare your genetic algorithm with two other um, op global optimizers, gro global optimization algorithms we have on Python. These are packages which are inside SciPy. It's a package on, it's a library on Python. The code is here. If I want to show you what we have. This is the code I sent you. You're going to compare the e efficiency of the program you developed on C with what you have here. These are the definition of, of the functions, Levy, Gurank, and other ones. You don't need to do anything here. This is the dimension. You can change it to something else. These are the lower bound, upper bounds, boundaries for every function. And then you don't need to do this one. Just forget about this one. That was not a global optimization and then you have two global optimization uh, algorithms one is differential evolution and the other one is now uh, the dual something and then you're gonna use these two algorithms to optimize different functions and see how much they're working fast enough or accurate let's say if I'm using when I'm using the differential equations on levy function this is the best fitness value, value I got. Four power minus 30. But what I got here, what I got here is 0 0.40 something. So I'm 100% sure you can improve your code. Well, it's a different algorithm, different algorithms. Um, performance on different functions, different problems are different. You don't need to necessarily get to this one. First of all, you don't, you can get to this one because this is E minus 30 and you're working with double precision. Double precision has 15 digits accuracy after the decimal point. So you don't need to do this one. And this is also so the time it took the computer to optimize this problem. In my computer, let's say right now it was 70. Again, you, if you're doing the tests, just close other apps before you start um, doing the tests. We can see in some cases, it's not always that much accurate. Uh, in some cases, let's say this one. The value is minus 391. It means the program was not able to optimize that specific problem. This one. Uh, and it took like one second something. And then the other algorithm you can see the other algorithm in terms of optimizing the levy function. The order is at power minus 11. It's not strong as much as the other one, but it's much faster. Anyway, in the future, if you want to do, uh, you can create your own library on Python and compare uh, the efficiency of your genetic algorithm with two different algorithms here in this code you have. And you can add the code to your uh, GitHub. Do you have any questions?
everything clear which I know it's not that's fine if you have any questions feel free to ask yes oh I forgot to remove that one yeah. okay I'm gonna send you actually um, I was going to send you a LaTeX format but then I was thinking you can't do it's a just two three tables you can create those tables but anyway, yeah that's fine I can I'll send you that one too I share the uh, latex bar on Teams. Any questions? This assignment need a lot needs a lot of um, studying. You have to study about what genetic and doing some s research. Which uh, I think also the purpose of this not just this course undergraduate studies is not just learning how to program. Is also um, thinking like an engineer if you don't have the solution you need to uh, be able to search on the internet the other thing is I give something an assignment like this one something that uh, if you encounter a problem probably ChatGPT is not gonna be able to answer the question one of the questions let's say one of the um, things that ChatGPT might not be able to give you an answer let's say the same example I gave you about a random number. Usually we use a random function like this one. Then you're gonna see, okay, why it's not working? I'm using a random function. Why am I getting the good results? And that's where ChatGPT doesn't have the sense of an engineer. It might have in the future, but right now I'm sure it doesn't have. And you're gonna just uh, say, tell wh why you're communicating with ChatGPT. You're gonna say, okay, you know, I developed the whole genetic algorithm, which is not going to happen. In this RAND function here is going to work. But something like a problem similar to RAND function, you're going to tell ChatGPT, okay, ChatGPT, I use your code. Everything looks fine. I don't have any error or warning, but I'm not getting the best possible answer. And that's where ChatGPT cannot give you because ChatGPT doesn't have the sense of an engineer. And this problem was something you have to have a sense you have to know about the mathematics behind the problem and you have to know why does it matter to have an initial guess which is going to give me the most optimized solution again it's not going to happen in this problem genetic algorithm but sometimes it's possible that you're going to have in some problems that needs the mathematical the foundation needs to needs you to be able to understand the uh, foundation of the problem you're trying to solve and that was just one example here we had how much it matters to have a good truly randomized initial guess to find the most optimized solution i give you i gave you this assignment because again in this assignment you're going to have a bunch of warnings errors that chat gpt probably is not going to be able to give you the answer you need to study about the genetic coverage okay let's go back to one of the most important GDB using GDB or the LRDB to debug your program is uh, I think one of the most useful features that you can find in C but one of the most important one of the most confusing sections topics in C is pointers one of the most important topics in C is dynamic memory allocation something you don't see again on C on Python or higher programming languages because they're gonna handle those things automatically since they're working they're handling the memory allocation automatically it's easier to use but it's not necessarily uh, in a more the most optimized way and here we have to do this memory allocation automatically run this free.h in your computer to see how much memory you have this is gonna give me okay I have let's say 15 gigabytes this is different from the hard disk this is the memory I have and I just want to tell you that 
I'm going to show you in the future that uh, we are not so for whatever the code we wrote uh, we didn't use any of this memory we're just using something called stack and this stack is only 8,000 something kilobytes or I can say 8 megabytes so for whatever program we created is just using the 8 megabytes of the memory let's say this genetic algorithm you're going to develop you're going to use only 8 megabytes of the memory in the future if you want to create a better genetic algorithm sometimes they give you a higher dimension program and this 8 megabytes is not enough that's where you need to use this part and the only way you can do this is using memory allocation this is one example because we talk about this assignment for one hour I'm just gonna do a bunch of copy paste here okay but you can pause the video and write the program by yourself A new one practice just change it to something dynamic memory allocation. I'm gonna just call it DMA. Okay, uh, what we're gonna do. Um, I'm just going to remove this one, scanf. I'm just going to use, uh, let's do this one. Int n, and what I can say, a2 i, hard b. So I'm going to just change out of the input. We know now this part, the character, and then this is a pointer called arg v, and this is an array. So now we know this is a pointer to an array of characters. You can print this out. You can set up a GDB breakpoint exactly here and print this one out to see what's happening here. But whatever I give as the input to my program is going to be received as a string and this string is going to be saved inside argv, the array of characters. And then I'm going to use, okay, use the first element and change it to an integer value. This is what I did so far. Then I want to use the memory allocation to use the real part of something called heap, not a stack. I want to use the heap part of the memory, which is 16 gigabytes, not just limited to 8 megabytes. And I use something called malloc, memory allocation. You can call it malloc, you can call it malloc, it's up to you. But anyway, this function, also, I told you about the pointer, that why we need pointers in memory allocation. If I remove this one, you know this part. Int, then this asterisk, array is equal to if you remember this was a pointer then I can say it's equal to something but right now I'm going to say it's equal to some people develop a, call, a function called malloc to automatically handle memory allocation you could write the code for yourself but there is a function here on C the most optimized function possible you can use to allocate the memory and when you're allocating the memory, you say just m alloc, and then here you give the size of you want to allocate. Let's say here this one uh, it's an integer pointer, point a pointer pointing at an integer. So technically, whatever I'm going to point at, let's say I have an array, and this array has the size of n. 10 let's say 10 elements and each element is going to have the type of an integer and every integer is going to take this size the return of this size is in bytes so technically i'm saying n 
times the byte of an integer so technically this is the bytes this is the output of this one is in bytes I'm telling computer in bytes how much memory I want and in this case depends on the input let's say 1000 2000 five only one one means only I need four bytes because every integer is gonna take only four bytes we had this function size of in the past always 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 double check if the memory allocation was successful this is the this is the reason why many programs they crash you play a game you you're working with a program and they don't change they don't check this memory allocation and the program just crashes for no reason and it's not giving you any error or warning if I am allocating the memory and I don't have enough space left which right now I have this one used four gigabytes free this much and then this available this is the memory right now I have available if for some reason let's say I'm just n is two billion or something two billion times the four bytes is it enough do I have enough space just double check that one first and then we're gonna keep we're gonna move forward to check this one this means an array an array is a pointer if you remember uh, this is if I want to say okay let's say this one equal to five I'm saying that a specific address we had this one in the past that is specific address that this pointer is pointing at put the value of the five inside that specific address the other one on the other hand is an address I can say this one is equal we had this one in the past to the other address of something which right now address is not defined but anyway let's say just uh, I can say the address of n for example it should be equal to something address of something and this is if you remember it was 0x something it's an address inside the memory and now if this address does not exist if it's equal to null it means it does not exist an address is like saying okay a number which does not exist but here in the pointers if something does not exist a pointer doesn't exist we say it's going to be equal to null I could initialize this one to null to saying is equal to null then do this one if it is still to null then the memory allocation failed remove this one and then the number of the element the size of the each element um, well I can instead of doing this one I can just put int or I can just say the value which is saved inside the address we talked about this one this right now it's a pointer to the first element of the array to the only to the first element of the array and because the element is an integer then I'm gonna grab the value which is saved inside that one and find the address which again it's the type integer and every integer is gonna take four bytes the number of the elements and then print out the value of the first element which right now it's a garbage value because I did not initialize always always this is the second source of why many programs they crashes and you have to force to stop those programs after they do the memory allocation they do not free up the memory and then you're going to build the memory up some uh, on another memory which was already reserved as long as you don't free up the memory that part of the memory is not going to be accessible always free up the memory after allocating the memory anyway let's GCC this program and then if I want to run it I have to give the n it's better always here after every input check for format of the inputs and give a message to the input to the user if something is wrong with the input but right now we're going to skip this one if it's I'm going to create an array which has only 10 elements if I enter this one 
So the number of the elements is 10. Each element is gonna get four bytes. If I change this one to double, well, double, I guess, in my, double in my computer is taking 64 bits. So now instead of four bytes, I'm going to have eight bytes. We can try that one too. And the value which is saved inside the first element, again, it's a garbage value. I can change this one to, let's say double. It's an array of double. And this one must be also double because every element is gonna be double. And then what else? That's it. And also this one. I have to change this one to LF. Placeholder has changed. If I run this code with this 10, you can see each element is eight, uh, eight bytes. Anyway, every time uh, this array is initialized with zero. If I do something in value which is pretty big, well, this one is not gonna, this is an integer, the integer has uh, the maximum number an integer can be saved is I guess 2 billion something. Let's try that one. one two, three, six, seven, eight, nine. This is like the highest value can be saved as integer. And if I do this one, still my computer, so technically the size of the memory is this one times eight in bytes. If I wanna transfer bytes to gigabytes. Well, I have 16, so technically, not, I guess. Something uh, which is wrong, don't use this one. This is not correct. Every, every this much of byte is not equal to this one. We're gonna talk about this one. The memory now we know is a power of, is going to be taken with a power of two. And this, uh, to make it simple, let's say if I have one kilobyte of something, not kilobytes of something, if I have one kilobyte of memory, then it's equal to 10, 24 of, maybe I can just write it down here. It's less than 16 gigabytes anyway, but uh, one kilobytes is equal to 10 24 bytes. And this is something Google is missing, uh, messing with. I don't know why it says this one, but in the real world, in the computer world, kilo is, I know one kilo is equal to 1000, but not when it comes to memory. In, when it comes to memory, go back to binary representations and the way that we used to save every number in the computer, this is the way it's happening. And 10 power two, it's like, if you remember, we had four bits, then we had eight, 32, 64, 100, and it keeps going on and on. It's a power of two. This is not happening, but this computer here Google is giving you this one. This is not correct anyway. Um, let's go back. So this is the way we do the memory allocation. It's pretty simple. You use malloc and the size of the memory you want in bytes. The format is in bytes. Keep going forward. Um, this is the same stuff we're talking about. Always deallocate the memory and this is also something you might see as a syntax like you might use just m alloc or you might see something this before m alloc both are the same doesn't make any difference um, if you want to print out the value of the each element you can use this syntax just a for loop this one or you can use this star and then the pointer you can iterate over the pointer we had this one during one of the sessions when we were using the gdb 
this is something I see usually. Uh, I find it confusing for students. That, that's why I just wanted to mention here how I can print the address or the value of that specific element. Or if, if I want to just uh, pr uh, print the addresses, I can use this, just ARR. Technically, right now, we said this ARR is a pointer. If I want to get the value inside that pointer, I have to put this star behind it. That's why we have this star here. If I want to print only the address, I can just use this address or I can just use this one and with this placeholder, of course. Anyway, you can do, you can try, you can improve this code by printing out the elements. You can initialize each element by something, then you can continue working on this part of the lecture. Uh, the next one is another function called Cialloc. I don't know what, what the C stands for, but um, we can think about that, okay, you can search about it. The difference is, is instead of the input element, and instead of asking you for the size of the memory you want to use, it's going to ask you for two input arguments, how many elements you want, and what's the size of the, each element. So technically this function is just gonna calculate this uh, n times this this one, which is not a significant difference, and this is what you're going to have. So the other one was m alloc, the total size of the memory you want to allocate. This one is c alloc, but. Um, you have to give two input arguments, one the number of the elements and the other one uh, the size of each element. If I run this code, this is what I'm gonna get. It tells Cialloc also initialize all the values to zero, but we can see in some computers, even using this m alloc, it's already going to initialize the array with zeros. So some people might not see the difference between the C alloc and m alloc in this term, like in terms of initializing to zero, because both are going to initialize to zero in their computers. Anyway, pretty everything the same. No difference between this one and the other one. We talked about why why we are using this um, why we are using this um, memory allocation again. So far, we didn't use this memory, this part of the memory. Whatever we did program, let's say the game your friend developed, it's, it was a graphical game, still it was using only eight megabytes of the memory because whatever we did was not using any memory allocation. And M, if you wanna check the size of this stack on your computer, you can use this syntax, U limit S. You can type it here. You limit dash s, and this is in kilobytes. If you need to, I changed a little bit this part of the late uh, lecture notes. I'm going to uh, push the updates to GitHub, but doesn't make any much difference. I just the way it was presented, I, I, I was thinking last night it's not good enough, so I made minor changes here. Anyway, if you wanna see what this dash s stands for. You can use u limit dash dash help, and this is the limit, and this is the dash capital S. This is the dash the maximum stack size, and then I come here says the values are in ten twenty four bytes, which we call that kilobytes. So technically, whatever this dash s is returning to me is going to be in kilobytes. And every kilo, again, in computer world, every kilo is 1024, 1024. Except for this one, this one, that doesn't matter. Anyway, this thing which I got is 8,000 something kilobytes, or I can say times 1024, 
because it's a kilo, I can say times 1024, then I get the in bytes. So I have these bytes of the memory on a stack, or if I get this kilobyte and divide it by 1024, kilo to megabyte. I want to change the kilo to megabyte, and the difference is in mathematical way, kilo to mega is 1000, but in computer, we know the memory, when we're talking about the memory, it's 1024, it's not 1000, exactly equal to 1000. Anyway, if I divide this kilobyte to 1024, I'm gonna get the size in megabyte, which is, let's say, equal to uh, eight megabytes. This is what we're gonna do here. This code, I changed the code a little bit too. It was slightly confusing. This is the code I have, and what I want to do, I have, uh, well, this is the input. Okay, this line is going to give me the size of each element, the size of an integer, just an integer. An integer, we already know, is 32 bits or 4 bytes. The maximum f uh, possible value an integer can set. This is something we used to have an integer part saying, okay, what is the maximum value of we can save as an integer? If the range is not enough, I have to go with uh, something else. We, I have to go with long integers. And right now I'm just using this or on sign integer. I'm just printing out what is the maximum integer value you can save to make sure that the integer overflow is not going to happen. Going back here, I have my stack has this kilobytes of the memory. Times 1024, I get the size of bytes. Divided by four, because each integer is gonna give me, is gonna take four bytes of the memory, the value is equal to this one. This is the number of arrays, the number of the elements, the number of integers I can save on this size of memory. If I go beyond this value, my stack doesn't have enough space to save that array. And then I s potentially gonna see some, um, something called a stack overflow and it's different from integer overflow. Integer is the range is not enough, stack overflow, the memory is not enough to save that. Anyway, if I try to have an array which has this number of elements, the type is integer, my memory is not gonna be enough. And I expect to see an error. And this is what we're gonna do here. So how many integers I can, I wanna save, let's say I'll call that size, and this size is equal to this one. The maximum number of integers I wanna save on stack. I should already know that I'm already using my stack in other programs, probably other programs are working on my computer. Other programs are working on my computer. Probably they're already using a part of my stack memory. So my stack is not gonna be 100% free. It's already, it's already taken. So this eight megabytes of memory, probably I have only seven megabytes free to use. But Anyway, I'm just using this one, which is going to take only 8 megabytes. And one thing, I send this size to something, a function called allocate on heap. Heap is the other one, the other part of the memory, which is 16 gigabytes, which is something gigabytes. I have an office space. And I'm saying an office space because if I have this size, an array with this, this number of elements and every element is integer, it's gonna take only eight megabytes of my memory, which on my memory, I have gigabytes. It's, it's more than enough. But on a stack, I send this one to stack this um, allocate on heap, and I try to use this allocation function. You don't need to keep this one again. You can keep it, but you don't need to. And then I'm gonna say, okay, if it is not equal to null, it means it does exist. The memory allocation was successful. 
then print this message saying memory allocation on heap was successful, which I expect to be successful because I have gigabytes. Right now I'm just talking about eight megabytes, eight megabytes of the memory. Then I'm going to say, okay, print the memory which was taken from my, uh, print uh, the size of the memory which is taken here, also tell me how much it's gonna take, which in this case, it's gonna be eight megabytes or it's kilobytes and kilobytes we have this number I expect to see something like this one because I already did the calculation here and if it's not successful just tell me okay memory allocation failed which is not gonna happen then in the next function I'm sending this size to something called allocate on stack this is something we usually do we wanted to initialize an array this is the formulation this is the syntax we use we say integer and then the name of the array and then the size I can say it's equal to something I can open the parentheses and say it's equal to 5.6 whatever it is but I'm not going to initialize anything to it I'm just going to declare it and by declaration it means I'm going to reserve the part of the memory to save this array this is the size is this one I'm going to save this size of the memory, this size of, uh, this number of integer values, and every integer is taking again uh, this memory and four bytes. Technically, I'm going to end up with eight megabytes of memory, which I'm going, I'm asking for here. And here, you're going to see because I don't have enough space. This is what we have done so far. You're gonna see only to use eight megabytes, eight megabytes of the memory. I don't have a space enough, and I'm gonna see some error problem here. Let's run this code. This is what I see in my computer. So, the size of an integer is four bytes maximum possible value that the integer type can save is two billion something so technically i just printed out for two reasons one is to double check this size equal to big large number is not going to have a stack over an integer overflow i just wanted to make sure which this number is much lower than the this number this is about the scale of this one is about million this one is about billion so integer overflow is not going to happen the second reason i brought this integer overflow something we had in the past year too i wanted to tell you integer overflow is different from stack overflow stack overflow is about memory anyway this is not going to happen here the integer overflow is not going to happen here and what i say okay send this number to memory heap and allocate this size of the memory and the memory is telling me on heap memory allocation was successful the allocated memory is something like 8192 kilobytes and I printed out this by this line of the code I'm saying size times the size of every integer which is in bytes so technically this is in bytes and then I'm saying divide this byte to 1024, then I can get kilobytes. That's why I'm having these kilobytes. Because there is a division here, I change, I convert uh, the precision to double, because there is a, again, division here, it's not integer anymore. That's why I'm using also the placeholder LF. Anyway, this is the kilobytes of the memory. We're talking about only kilobytes of the memory, which was taken from my right now from heap i said i try to do the same thing on the other function and i use stack part of the memory this is used this syntax is going to stack and i can see i have an error called segmentation fault segmentation fault means this error is created right now i know this error is created in this line right now i know this error is created on this line uh, and the next line was not um, executed but some cases it's not easy to find this segmentation fault error where it's happening and I need to set up some breakpoints
to find the problem like using GDB setting up some breakpoints and then see what's happening and if you don't know the concept of this stack overflow you're gonna see okay you're gonna at the end you're gonna end up finding this problem okay this is the line is causing the problem but the syntax is correct why I am I'm having this error I mean again the computer is not gonna give you any information about this this is the only thing which you're gonna see in your computer is a segmentation fault and that's the reason behind it is because my stack has exactly this size and I know this size is not completely available in my computer maybe I decrease it like let's say with 500 elements so technically I'm going to decrease 500 elements less 500 times 32 bits every integer is taking 32 bits 5 times 32 bits this is um, the amount of the size of the memory I'm going to take less than the previous example I hope this one well still I don't have enough space let's say 5,000 again I told you this stack is already being used with other programs okay right now those on heap and a stack I had enough space I have enough space on a stack right now 8,172 kilobytes so in this case this was successful but again, if you want to go much higher on, let's say, talking about gigabytes, then definitely you cannot use a stack. You can check, again, you can check the stack size of your memory with this syntax, your limit caches. Moving forward. There's a function called realloc. Uh, it happens during the programming you're reading a file then you're going to decrease the size or increase the size of the allocation and this is where this is the function you can use you can create an error you can allocate the memory let's say with initial size let's say it's five elements and every element is an integer so five times four bytes 20 bytes of the memory so initially you're gonna use 20 bytes of your memory then something happens you want to extend the memory that you want to use and to 10 let's say you want to double it this is the place first you use malloc to uh, allocate the memory for ARR this array then at one point something happens within your program you grab this ARR and you give it the new size you want and the new size again is going to be the second argument the second input the argument is in size like um, in bytes let's say right now is resize resize is equal to 10 10 equal 10 times the size of an integer so 10 times 4 bytes which is 40 previously it was 20 bytes of the memory taken now I'm saying this array I want to extend it to have another 20 bytes the new size is going to be 40 bytes and this is the syntax you can use you can print out um, the addresses you can print the values uh, I leave this code to you um, to handle with this one anyway what you can just do you can just go through this for loop and print out the values and also the addresses something we had in the past do you have any questions about memory allocation why we're doing this what's the purpose pretty boring huh C is pretty boring I remember the first time I took C I almost failed the course like I was two two months I guess um, I gave my project to my professor and the final project and he was keep revising the project and it was like two months after the semester was over I was keep editing the project he was keep adding something to the project and at the end I guess I barely passed the course with a grade of I don't remember but it was 14 or 15 out of 20 yeah you can laugh I see your grade <laughs> So anyway, I know it's pretty mm, boring right now, but when you you get your hands on it and 
depending again what, on what project you're gonna work with sometimes um, it's better to use with higher programming languages the efficiency of the computation doesn't matter much why why I have to go after C but sometimes when you're doing some serious programming you're working for servers you are working for social let's say platform and the back of program should be something which is fast enough because if it's fast enough I don't need too much computer facilities you're gonna decrease the capital cost investment lots of things you're gonna uh, avoid lots of problems yes it, it can be more uh, you're gonna have more error issues probably bugs in your program because it's C you have to manually handle everything but it's going to be much faster. Uh, this was pretty much everything about dynamic memory allocation. The next topic is inputs and outputs from uh, in a C code. We already had some inputs given by user using this scanner function. The other one, some inputs were given by this int main. Um, command line argument uh, arguments the other thing the other uh, type of the inputs we can read a file uh, and do whatever we want let's say I have Let's say I have a f uh, file called a.txt. It's a, a text file, and I have these values here. First row, I have three uh, double values, second row, and the third row. And I want to read this, and I want to save it inside a 2D array. I can save it in 2D array, I can print it, I can do whatever I want. But, but the first thing is just reading the file. This is the general syntax, we're gonna do it. Let's have this code. So before running this code, you need to create a LaTeX um, um, text file that has this information in it. Let's go to this code. I'm going to Okay, this is the code I have. Now we know what is a pointer. There, when I'm reading a file, there is a new type. We had integer, we had double, we had characters. We, ha we talked about many data types we can have in a C code. And now there's a new data type call, called file. And I'm saying file, let's say in the past we had integer something. This keyboard integer something right now I'm saying there is a new data type called file and then I have a pointer so I have a pointer called file pointing at a specific part of the memory which is going to say is reserved to save a file I read this file now after this line this a.txt file is opened and saved accessible on my memory going back here this is my a.txt file and when I'm talking about memory because I'm using this one and this is also going to do a memory allocation which we don't see it right now it's behind the, this program it's not gonna be on a stack it's going to be on my memory anyway this is what we do we open this one and then we say if it's equal to null this is a pointer. If a pointer is equal to null, it means it does not exist yet. Give me this error. Say, okay, something happened. I couldn't open this file. And I'll return one. Return means do not bother yourself with the rest of the program. It's better also to return zero if it's successful. And then I have, uh, forget about this one. 
I have a while loop and I use fscanf. fscanf is something that goes inside the, um, inside the um, file that I just read and it's gonna save every number inside uh, a double well right now I'm reading a double so the way you're writing the program is also dependent on let me just do it here. this is the file I have every number has why well, I could save everything here inside a float type it didn't need to be double by the way I know it's a floating point number either I have to save it in float or double or long double Anyway, that's why I created this double uh, number here. Then I'm saying, while you're reading this file, keep this placeholder long F. I could, again, I could just say it's F and change also that double to float. Keep this placeholder and save everything inside the address of number, which number is a pointer, uh, not a pointer, number is an integer. I'm saying just go put it inside that a specific address of the memory and as long as this is true it's happening there is a number to read it's gonna give you, it's gonna return you one and that number is saved every time I'm saying okay print the value of the number this um, you have to this F gets F, F gets C is gonna check it's gonna read the next character the character right after this one after the number let's say this is what happening here going back here this is what I have it's gonna read this one then it's gonna read the character ad after that number and it's gonna say okay is it back a slash n which I know it's not back a slash n this is a space it's not a back a slash uh, n or is it end of the file this is EOF end of the file is here if let's say I'm line 9 line 9 is end of the file there is no line 10 right now end of the file is line 3 like when it goes to line 4 there is nothing doesn't exist it's end of the uh, file this is just a format uh, I want to print out inside the terminal but anyway uh, next number is not a backslash n or end of the file so it goes to the next double number which is this one then again it's a space then it's next number something you don't see right now in a visual way but it's saved this way in the computer if you remember every uh, this backslash n means going to the next one this is how it's saved inside the computer also this is space also has a syntax you can search it on the internet but anyway max backslash n means going to the next line this is actually the way that is saved inside the computer this is the way it's going to be saved inside the computer but to make it more visually appealing they said okay let's remove this backslash n and if you want to show it to people just show it this way so anyway technically after each line this is a bank slash n and if there is a bank slash n just print out this bank slash n go to the next line I want to print out line by line go to the next line do not stay in the same line if I compile this code you can set up some breakpoints do this as a practice at home use GDB set up a break breakpoint here and keep doing continue 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 going to the next iteration going to the next iteration and check out whatever you have here Ch print the file print it this is going to be a pointer of course you're going to see an address check different things we have here check c every time print the c ch i'm sorry print this character and see what it is anyway after compiling this code this is what i get if i do not do this one everything is going to be printed out in the same line so technically this backslash slash n is doesn't have the purpose of reading it just organizing the way it is printed out inside the terminal um, 
you can see the code is kind of highly dependent on the type of the file I'm reading. So every file, you're going to end up to write a specific program for the type of the file based on the content it is saved inside the file. You're going to have, you have to write a totally separate uh, C code. If somehow you have, don't, don't do this one please at the beginning, just try to have some practice before using this. Again, ChatGPT doesn't have this sense of an engineer, but um, in the future, after you have developed a sense of an engineer, tr having some common sense about different potential errors and warnings, then you can use ChatGPT. The way you can say, write this code, in ChatGPT, you can say, I have a file named ATXC with the following content. Write the C code to read and uh, print each value in the terminal with the same format. Again, don't do this please right now here, especially in the next assignment, the fourth assignment, you're gonna have something reading. This is the opportunity, this is not about testing you, I don't wanna test you in this course. This is an opportunity to um, just starting to think like a programmer. This is what, uh, you can see like already the computer um, chat GPT is giving me totally not totally it's the, the concept is the same but this get C in my program I use F get C it's a different way to do that and it says get C if it's back a slash and go to the next slide this one is also gonna work This is gonna give me the same thing. Um, again, your program is unique, like handwriting. Depends who's writing, they might write the same program in a different way. I'm going to here, have some time left. Um, this one, the other program, The other program, I'm going to, you can read these options, it's in the lecture notes, but this means reading a file, this means writing a file. If I want to open a file, but I don't, I don't want to change any content, I want to make sure that accidentally, mistakenly, I'm not going to change anything inside the file, I want to keep the original file, I open it as the option only as reading, to make sure that, again, accidentally I'm not going to change the content inside the file. But I want to have the uh, .txt file. I want to have it as writing a file. I want to write something. So technically, I'm going to open this one, and then I'm going to create something called the .txt file. I do this once, and if one of them they don't exist, print out error in opening the files. Then I'm going to read. Uh, the same way I was reading the a.txt file, I can print out like number times two, whatever the number is, I wanna just say do a computation and just say times two. So anyway, this 1.1 is gonna be times two, 2.2. 2.2 is gonna be 4.4. Uh, the other one, I use the function f print f output file, which is technically this b.txt file and then keep the placeholder of LF with three digits, only three digits after the decimal point, write these numbers inside the file. I am going to generate a file which has this one times two. So technically, the array of B is equal to the array, or you can call it a matrix, 
is equal to two times of the array or the matrix A. This is what I'm doing. And then I save everything inside another file, which is B. The rest is the same format. And at the end, again, if I see a backslash and do the same backslash and when you're printing the B file. And at the end, I always I have to close the files. If you, I don't close the files, there is a memory allocated to keep these files open. After I'm done with that, I have to close the files. If I don't, I'm not freeing up. I'm not cleaning my memory, which at one point I need to restart my computer. Anyway, uh, during this one, I can see that I just created a file called B, and B is the same as 2 times A. Set up some breakpoints again here to see what's happening. I know at the beginning it's a little bit confusing. Uh, you need to understand the previous code before you run this one because this one is just uh, the same code but just adding, uh, create, saving whatever I do inside another file. There is another topic. We're going to cover this one then we're, we're done with this session. Uh, called the structures. Sometimes you're going to have a more complex data structures when you're programming. And something which is much easier in Python because in Python you have pandas, you have, you have different things. You have data frames and you can, infill, you can go crazy about the way you want to save your data and make it easier to understand. But here we, we could see that we have some simple data structures like so far. You have something like an array, an array which every element is going to be an integer. But in some cases, again, you might have a more complex data structure. That's where you start using uh, something called struct or structures inside C. This is the way you define a structure and then you give the name, you open the curly parentheses and you mention the members of your structure. We're gonna have one simple example here. I'm going to create a new one. And I'm just going STC. Okay, this is uh, what I have. Let's say I have an structure called person. This is the name I am given. I can change this name to anything I want, but this is the structure, this is the syntax. Then this person has some members. Members is something, we're gonna talk about it in a more uh, syntax way, but members some, is something that I can say within this person structure. And this person has an array as a member. This is an array. The type is character and the size is 50. And so technically I can save a string inside this person. With this string, I can save an integer value of age and height. This is, let's say I am in a, I don't know, library or something. I wanna keep the information of every person and this is how I can save it. Every person is going to have one name, age, and height. And this is how I define my structure, and this is how I use my structure. I say structure, don't do this one. If I, su if I do person, then the computer is going to say, okay, what's person? Person is something I define here. I have to give some hints. I have to say person is a structure that I defined previously here. Again, I can change this thing to anything I want. Now this person is my data type. A data type that I just created. And the name of this data type, let's say this is gonna be an, in, for example, this is gonna be an integer. Now, the name of this data type is person one. 
this is also a name I am giving and then I want to copy paste I know this uh, this is the way I can access to the uh, to the each member of the structure I have I can say just person one and then this period and then then the name what I'm doing here I'm copying I'm using strcpy which is inside this library I'm copying whatever is in the second argument which is a string John Brown into this the string and then I'm going to say person one this period age is equal to 29 and then person one height is equal to 1.77 then I want to access to these members I want to print them out I have to say person one period name I know this name is a is an array of characters so technically this is a place placeholder I have to use for person one age I know this one is an integer that's why I'm using this integer placeholder and then the height is a double is a float number that's why I'm using this F this is how it works so what I did and instead of saving in different places one I have to have let's say name and then age high separately I saved everything inside person one I didn't save it in different names I have all these things inside person one and right now this is just one person I can have an array of structures I can have an array of a structure the same structure then when I'm defining this one and instead of saying person one I'm going to give another name something which would make sense people but then I'm saying it has three elements this case I have an array called people and every element has a person structure and in every element I can save in a string I can save an integer I can save a float and the next element I can do the same thing the difference is I can use every element of this array for a different person you can see already that you can go infinitely crazy to save the most complex possible data structures I can have another structure here I can have a structure inside another structure which right now we're not gonna do it but depends on how much complex data structure you have you can do anything you want here anyway right now I have an area of a structure sorry guys it's taking a little bit of time but just give me five minutes I'm gonna finish everything um, the first element of the people structure this is something which is going to be also in the next week quiz so I have to finish it this week uh, I have uh, an array called people the first element of this array has the name of um, this is oh, let me, let me just click this one has the name the name is the member of this structure and I'm copying pasting everything of this string inside this name I'm copying pasting Walter White inside the name of people and then the age 29 at the height this one the same indexing way we had in the arrows right now we have an array of structures I can go access to the member of this array and then this is the second element index one Rick Sanchez and then Mike Wazowski and I can keep going as much as I need if I want to print them out I have three elements I have an array of three elements and every element is going to be accessed by people I and if I want to access to the member of those elements simple I can do this one if I run compile and run this code this is what I'm gonna get person one Walter White H height and the rest
The other thing, sometimes you may see in the future that instead of accessing to the member of the function, people dot, people period, and then whatever is the mem member, the name of the member, you might see something like this. And this is because this one is a pointer to structure. The same thing we had about pointer to integer, pointer to something, we have exactly the same thing here in structures. We have also something called pointers to a structure. But if you want to access to the member, and instead of using this period, you have to use this dash, then this inequality sign. Anyway, this is the example of how the pointer to structure works. So I have, uh, this structure has name and age, and then I have person one, it has John. I can give, I can, I'm technically I am declaring and initializing the same line because this is an, a string. That's why I'm giving this input as a string. And the second one is an integer because the age is an integer. This is the way I'm giving the information. And when I want to access to the element, I use this dot name and dot age to print out whatever I want. Next structure is person pointer. I have a pointer here. This one is going to point at the address where person one was saved. So technically this one is pointing at the address of this one. And in this case, when I want to access to the member, instead of using this period, I have to use this dash and then this syntax. This is the way I'm going to access. If I, this is going to give me the same thing. If this is a pointer and I try to use this one, this is the error you're going to see. You don't have it. It's something might be a little bit difficult, challenging to find what's the problem, but as soon as you start seeing this er error frequently, you're going to figure this er problem. If I compile this code, it's already going to give me something like this. So get used to this error if you're using a structure because you're going to see it a lot. Anyway, this is the pointer to structures. I leave the next example to you. This is a little bit more way of using a structure. I have a structure called book and then this is a program you can write for a library, for example, to, to organize their books and those people who are borrowing a book. And inside another structure, library member, I have another structure, which is the structure of the book. So I have an structure inside another structure. So write down this code by yourself. This is the best practice you can have for structure. The other difference here is I'm also giving you whatever we practice so far. I'm, we're going to split the code based on the purpose. I have a structure.c, and I have functions.c, I have a function.c. So I'm splitting the same code into multiple files. For more practice, I'm going to write the make file as well. Write the make file. I'm 100% sure if you write this program by yourself, don't copy it anything, don't copy anything here, you're gonna understand the most of the topics we have talked so far in this course in terms of splitting a code um, based on the purpose, creating make file, and most of the things. Anyway, this is something that uh, until this section we're gonna cover in the next quiz. If you don't have any questions, you're good to go.